founded the Global Risk Network at the World Economic Forum. What do you see as the greatest global risks today? Unless you are a hardcore denialist or conspiracist, you, you, you know climate change is our foremost risk. What is the role of entrepreneurship in making the Great Reset a reality? The solution regarding climate change is, of course, political, but it's not going to be sufficient. Um, you cannot just impose regulations or carbon tax. Entrepreneurship has a very, very, very fundamental role to play because most of the solutions, we hope, are likely to come from tech innovation. What is the importance of narratives and how do they shape our societies? You know, we think that we are rational decision makers, but uh, fundamentally, we share stories. Stories often become self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, they compel us to adhere to the story and to modify our behavior accordingly. Welcome. My name is Daniel Durlay, and I'm the president of the Global Young Entrepreneur Society. The Global Young Entrepreneur Society is an international nonprofit organization supporting exceptional young people in achieving their entrepreneurial ambitions. Co-hosting the interview with me today is Louis Swire, the director of GS's UK operations and the editor-in-chief of the Curious Times. Joining us today is Thierry Malloray, the founder and managing partner of the Monthly Barometer. The Monthly Barometer is an analytical and predictive newsletter on macro issues for high-level decision makers. Thierry founded the Monthly Barometer Summit of Minds, which is a series of high-level meetings that combine hard thinking on major macro issues and the importance of personal well-being and the power of nature. Thierry has been the chief economist and strategist of a major Russian investment bank and an economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. He spent three years working for the French Prime Minister in Paris. Thierry founded and headed the Global Risk Network of the World Economic Forum and for a number of years was responsible for the program of the annual meeting at Davos. Today, Thierry is an agenda contributor at the World Economic Forum. His latest books, COVID-19, The Great Reset, and the great narrative for a better future, co-written with World Economic Forum founder and executive chairman Klaus Schwab, have been translated into multiple languages, and The Great Reset is an international bestseller. He holds two master's degrees, one in economics and one in history, and a PhD in economics. We are very pleased to welcome Thierry Malloray. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you both. It's great to have you on. Today, thousands of the world's most important decision makers rely on your predictive analysis. What is your story? What were the major milestones of your career? Thank you for asking. First of all, I'd like to introduce a degree of humility. I don't know whether it's a listen to my advice, but at least some of them read what I write, which is um, equally important and rewarding. In, um, in the early 2000s, um, there was, at that time, at the World Economic Forum, a council called the Business International Council, composed by 100 of the most important global CEOs um, globally, um, with uh, geographical distribution across five continents. And um, and during a break, um, a coffee break, I asked one of them, um, what is important? What would be important to you? What could we do for you that we don't do at the moment? And he said, and that struck me very vividly at that time, he said, when you are a CEO, when you are an accomplished entrepreneur, when you run a business employing hundreds of thousands of employees in X countries around the world, the big problem is information overload. Um, you receive stuff, analysis, information, reports from all over the world in such quantities that you cannot distill them. And um, as a result, it's incredibly difficult to make up your mind about the big issues that matter to, to your business. Will we have inflation or not? Will we have a war with Russia or not? Uh, will there be a sudden deceleration of growth in China, et cetera, et cetera? 
Well, these are today's issues, of course, not those that prevailed 20 years ago. And he told me, if someone could write for me a very short brief that in four minutes a month allows me to grasp what matters to me as a global CEO in terms of global issues, I'd go for it. So that was the inspiration um, that prompted me to then leave the forum and start this um, little business called the Monthly Barometer. So it shows that good ideas are always second-hand ideas. You think you have an original idea, but the original idea is always prompted by common suggestions, thoughts um, that emanate from other people whom you should listen to. Who is the monthly barometer for? And what is the purpose of Summit of Minds? Who wants to get a grasp in four minutes a month about the uh, the global issues um, that matter the most for, for decision makers. And uh, we, we have a very simple, uh, yet quite elaborate um, conceptual framework um, that is the following. If you want to think about the world, you can decompose what's happening in the world in zillions of different categories uh, and that you get confused, if not lost. So um, when I started the Global Risk Network, um, we used to work with um, academics, with CEOs, with um, opinion makers, with media leaders. And um, we thought what would be the most simple framework that would give us a good grasp of what's happening in the world, and yet that can be very easily be assimilated conceptually. And we decided that it would consist in decomposing the world into five big macro categories, economics, geopolitics, society, the environment, and tech. And this very simple conceptual framework is what has guided me over the past 10 years. And the Monty Bromana is about giving our subscribers a sense of how each of these and the way in which they conflict with each other is going to impact the world and the issues as we as we move forward. The Summit of Minds is an added component to the monthly barometer. If you want to come up with good ideas, um, it requires more than reading books and articles, and you need to interact with people. There is nothing richer than having a than being a, given a chance to interact with your peers. Uh, not necessarily people who think like yourself, because otherwise you're going to belong to a club in which you know you generate a lot of group thing. But being able to afford exposure to div to to diverging ideas, to different opinions, to original thoughts, and this is what the summit of mind is all about. We convene people. Uh, we look at these five macro categories, and um, we try to allow every one of our participants to forge an opinion about what's coming next by being put in a position where you are confronted with different opinions. I'll give an example. If you want to understand whether a conflict between the US and China is likely in the foreseeable future, you don't want to spend your time talking exclusively to American think tanks. You know, If you do that, you are going to get an American view, of course. Um, similarly, you want to do the same with Chinese think tanks. You want to bring both around the table and structure a conversation in such a way that you can have a cautious, original, well-framed conversation with people who are going to generate insights for you. And that's how you create your own opinions. And that's how you come up with new ideas. Um, as I said, a few minutes ago, all good ideas are second-hand ideas. Business business ideas. Uh, uh, many entrepreneurs replicate ideas that existed in the past, but they do it either by changing incrementally some of the principles that underpin this idea, or they are better at execution. Um, so it's critically important to, to get as much exposure as possible to different views, and not views that are applicable to your domain of expertise. You know, if I, I'm an economist, if I spend my life with economists, I won't learn very much. I'm an economist and I want to spend life with my, my, my time with uh, scientists, with biotechnologists, with um, foreign affairs people, with philosophers, with uh, religious leaders. That's how you enrich yourself, by g getting exposed to different ways of life and different sorts, processes. 
you founded the Global Risk Network at the World Economic Forum. What do you see as the greatest global risks today? Well, every year the Global Risk Network convenes um, hundreds of experts in different domains, um, according to these five macro categories that I just presented to you. And we ask them um, to rank the global issues in terms of their relevance. Um, so the likelihood of the occurrence and the impact they have on the uh, on our activities, on the globe, etc. So now for several years in a row, and not uh, not unsurprisingly, the um, risk that has come on top of this is uh, climate change, um, environmental degradation, biodiversity. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, the risk of the occurrence is 100%. By now, we know this, and we've known it for a while, but um, when I created the Global Risk Network 20 years ago, there were many people disputing this evidence, even though, even at that time, the evidence was almost incontrovertible. But by now, it's a fact, and uh, unless you are a hardcore uh, denialist, or conspiracy, conspiracist, you, you, you know that climate change is our foremost um, risk because it's probably the only risk um, that is existential in nature for for all of us. So it's risk number one, um, and then you can you know decline it in many different ways. Uh, it's associated with uh, geopolitical risk, with uh, water supply risk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the the, the big macro risk that concerns us all is, is um, climate change and uh, environmental degradation. It's important also to understand that the two go hand in hand, that the two faces of the same coin. We think of climate change, but in fact, two, the two, two facets, uh, two sides of the, of the same coin, and they are totally interconnected with each other. What is the role of entrepreneurship in making the Great Reset a reality? So the you know, when we talk about the Great Reset, um, it boils down to two very simple things. And the fundamental argument made in the book is that um, we should we should make uh, the world more uh, respectful of Mother Nature, and we should make the world more equitable. Because uh, another very big risk is the risk of inequality, is a risk caused by inequalities worldwide, by, by rising inequality. And so what, what's the role of uh, entrepreneurship? Well, entrepreneurs are people who take risks and build a business. You know, I think that's the simplest definition of uh, entrepreneurship. So the solution regarding climate change is, of course, political. Uh, uh, obviously, we, we all understand this. You know, policymaking is a very fundamental role to play. But it's not going to be sufficient. Um, you cannot just impose regulations or carbon tax. So uh, it, it won't suffice to resolve the problems that we collectively face. And uh, in the book, we make the argument that entrepreneurship has a very, very, very fundamental role to play because most of the solutions, we hope, are likely to come from tech innovation. And the only group that can translate science into Practical applications are entrepreneurs, investors, uh, right, people who invest in entrepreneurship. And um, you know, I can elaborate on that, but at the moment, um, uh, most of the um, most applicable solutions that we, we have in terms of dealing with this massive uh, existential risk are to be found in business, uh, you know, whether it's uh, solar panels, wind farms. Um, carbon capture, etc. And in fact, at the Summit of Mines, we award a prize called the Good for Nature Award, International Award. And um, it's um, it's something in which I have phenomenal pride because um, we, we review about 1,000 startups every year from all over the world um, that are the confluence of tech and nature-based solutions. And I find it admirable that among these 1,000 startups, I think about 800 are led, are led by very young people, you know, so people who have a vision, who decided to become entrepreneurs because at the level they're going to provide a solution to the problems that we face, whether it's uh, you know, carbon emissions, treatment of waste, um, 
biodiversity, reforestation, uh, all the small blocks that um, hopefully when addressed in a meaningful manner will help us sort out the phenomenal problem that we, we face, global problem. So the role of entrepreneurship is uh, absolutely massive. And similarly, for the other issue, there is a big discussion at the moment, a big argument going on around the world on uh, stakeholder companies versus shareholder companies. Which one should prevail? Does a company, does a company, does a new business has a responsibility have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the range of uh, stakeholders, not only the shareholders but society at large, the clients, the employees, uh, local community, etc. And again, it strikes me that when researching the book, many, many young entrepreneurs are acutely aware that the responsibility is much broader than only vis-à-vis -vis the shareholders. They are concerned about the local communities, they are concerned about treating the workforce as fairly as they possibly can. Um, and um, I take it as a sign of encouragement. I think that your generation, the younger generation, um, is going to do business in a way that is fundamentally different from the way that prevails at the moment in so many countries around the world. What is the future and significance of entrepreneurship in the post-2030 new global order? We are in an era characterized by phenomenal exponential progress in science and tech. So much going on, we try to, to grasp the essence in the book about the progress being made in science and tech. And it's just phenomenal. You know, it's exponential. Um, it's um, it's interconnected. So what's, what, what happens in AI, for example, is bound to have an impact on what happens in uh, bioengineering. And uh, uh, you look at all these sub-components of, of tech and innovation, and you realize that they're deeply interconnected and uh, nourish each other and uh, exacerbate um, the speed of progress made within each of these categories in a way that would have seemed inconceivable just a few, a few years ago. Uh, for good and, and for bad, by the way, when you look at uh, you know, how well wars are now being um, waged, whether it's um, in Armenia two years ago, whether it's in uh, Ukraine today, you realize that uh, drones now have applications that were uh, maybe not inconceivable. They belong to the domain of science fiction until a few years ago. So all this is going to incredibly fast, but let's focus on the good stuff um, because this is what matters the most. Um, there is this phenomenal wave of innovation and I think it 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 paves a way for an equally impressive wave of entrepreneurship because there's so many opportunities to be grasped and there is so much appetite for innovating uh, and so much potential uh, because the cost of entry, uh, the bias to entry are being lowered. Uh, the cost of distribution of new ideas is equally being lowered, etc. So uh, we are probably entering an era in which um, entrepreneurship is going to be exploding um, with many, 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 many startups erupting in every single conceivable domain. And you see it at the moment. Um, you know, it's been the case since the pandemic happened. Uh, contrary to what many economists anticipated, a recession will be uh, detrimental to innovation and uh, will make people much more risk averse. In fact, it's the opposite that's, uh, that has happened. You have uh, a, an exploding wave of innovation um, that translates into entrepreneurship happening all over the world on five continents. And I take it as a sign of you know, great optimism. What is the importance of narratives and how do they shape our societies? Well, narratives are fundamental because we are, we are social animals. And um, we, we like stories. Um, that's how we are built. That's part of our DNA. Um, we've been like that for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So um, we, we, we have to understand that if you want to make a compelling case about something, it's a better um, argument based on PowerPoints or slides or presentations, because that's how we nourish our minds and that's how we um, 
compel people to 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 pay attention and uh, fundamentally narratives are a conduit for ideas that's how ideas are transmitted to people and uh, most of the decisions we make as economic agents are based on stories you know we think that we are rational decision makers and yes of course there is always a rational part of um, decision making but uh, fundamentally we share stories um, uh, how much is this going to to, to cost and uh, how much inflation do we have? Uh, we you know, there are zillions of stories being built around this, and in fact, um, um, stories often become self-fulfilling prophecies. You know, by building up, um, they create a momentum and they create threshold effects, and uh, they compel us to adhere to the story and to modify our behavior accordingly, and to enter into new ventures into new domains into new ideas uh, you know look at the story happening at the moment around tech and ai and the reason i think why there is such an explosion of ai um, startups all around the world is because there's so many positive stories associated with ai we see ai as a solution to many big problems that we face either society or individually and this prompts us to uh, embrace the story, the narrative, and engage into it and uh, become entrepreneurs and build businesses around this. So stories are extremely important. We, la- we, we live by them. You have said that every major shift in the world has winners and losers. Who will be the winners of the Great Reset and who will be the losers? Yes, there are always winners and losers, of course. And uh, in the case of the pandemic, there are two unmistakable winners. Um, one is tech. You know, the, the pandemic forced every one of every one of us to become techies or to build a tech business because when physical social interaction is limited, you need to resort to tools to conduct pretty much everything and certainly economic transactions, and things that were seen, seen as impossible just a few years ago, like um, telemedicine. You know, telemedicine was um, stuck because of regulatory issues. Uh, so, for example, in France, in my country, four years ago, we said, well, telemedicine is going to be something for 2050 or 2040 because there are so many regulations and so many concerns about how you can examine a patient through a camera or digital device. But it forced the pandemic and the lockdown forced a formidable acceleration of such technologies, which by now have become standard applications. You know, you don't go to a doctor anymore. Or you, you rarely, you more rarely do. Uh, if you need to see a dermatologist, you take a picture and then you send it to... Um, either uh, an AI device or to a dermatologist who, with the help of this device, is going to examine your your photo. And I could multiply such examples, um, you know, tech education, uh, uh, food tech, uh, tech and deliveries, uh, drawn to deliver your, um, your, your, what you buy in the supermarket, etc. So all this is coming. And it was certainly prompted by the pandemic. So tech is a big winner. If you didn't, if you did not embrace tech during the pandemic, you are left totally on the side of the road, and you are missing the momentum. The other one, which I think um, is uh, more intuitive, less obvious, less apparent, but it's a big winner of um, of the pandemic as. Um, as an industry is, is well-being and wellness. Um, you know, wellness doesn't mean very much because it's everywhere and nowhere. There isn't a, an asset class called wellness uh, or there isn't an industry called wellness, but there are many wellness goods that we can consume and buy. Um, and uh, the uh, pandemic, um, because of the way in which it uh, forced us to be locked down for, for, for weeks, sometimes for months, sometimes for years, like in China. Um, 
as as reignited this interest we have in health and our personal well-being, both physical and mental well-being. And um, I, I write also wellness barometers, so I, I have a very strong interest in, in these issues. And uh, I can see there is an explosion at the moment in um, in wellness activities. I think it's very directly correlated with what happened during the, the pandemic. So we are more attuned to the need we have, fundamental need we have to be well in our heads and, and in our bodies. And uh, it's um, something that is apparent, for example, in those great resignation phenomenon. You know, many people left the job uh, because they want meaning. And uh, you are very young, and I'm sure that when you uh, pursue your career, um, you'll be incredibly attentive to how you balance your personal life and your professional life. And maybe they'll be to totally merged. Uh, but the 70 hour week, like in the US, or 60 hour or 40 hours, I think it's uh, it, it's it's finished to a very large extent. Um, instead, we prefer to engage in well being activities, uh, consume wellness goods, whatever they may be. And that's also um, a big um, win of the pandemic. The losers, are those who are not capable of grasping these uh, emerging trends, you know, the obvious emerging trends, tech and well-being. If companies today, businesses do not provide a working environment that is conducive to well-being, they're bound to be in trouble. You know, uh, particularly if you are, you know, my younger colleagues, they want to be in a nice environment, understandably like all of us. So if you miss these, I think you're going to be in trouble. And in terms of industries as a whole, I think industries who are going to be facing a very difficult situation over the uh, coming years are those who miss the um, carbon emission turn and uh, inflection point. You know, you have to, to reduce your carbon emissions to the maximum possible extent, whatever you do, whether you are a water company, an oil company, an IT company, uh, a tourism, travel and tourism company. So you need to reduce your carbon emissions. Um, in the in the book, we make the argument, um, which I hope will prove to be true, that uh, if you don't do it yourself, you'll be forced to do it by youth activism, because the you know, the young population yourselves um, uh, will not accept anymore the way in which we destroy nature and uh, and uh, it needs is. Uh, zillions of carbon emission uh, uh, everywhere and I think it's true for every single country and every single continent um, so these are the big losers those who fail to take the measures that are now required to address this um, environmental issue um, if they don't move fast enough they'll be wiped out it's my very strong conviction which business books that had a major influence on you would you recommend for young entrepreneurs? Um, I talk a lot to, um, uh, to to global CEOs because that's business. And um, one of them um, said to me a few years back, don't read any business book, but instead talk to CEOs. Talk to the CEOs you admire and... Um, draw the lessons from the conversation you have with these people. I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but I don't I don't um, read very much uh, business books. I prefer to read novels because novels are the meta discipline by excellence. You read a novel and you learn about everything, including business and entrepreneurship. You need, uh, you know, you need, you read Dickens, you read uh, Zola, you read uh, Dostoevsky, and you learn a lot about how to create a business and uh, how to become an entrepreneur. And uh, I said to this gentleman, when he told me, uh, don't read too many business books, um, again, I realized it is a provocative statement, but um, I'm sure you don't mind. And I said, why? And, uh, and he said to me, well, for example, you take Jack Welch, General Electric. He was an icon, a complete icon, um, back in the 90s and, uh, and the early 2000s. And everybody had to read the books written by Jack Welch and every single CEO had to try to apply the insights from Jack Welch in his business. And uh, and uh, and today it's something that has been totally abandoned. You know, you do the opposite of what Jack Welch was recommending uh, probably 10, 
15, 20 years ago. Um, so some lessons can be can be uh, ingested um, in a in a very contrarian manner. You can also look at some uh, business books um, and decide that uh, maybe this is not what you, what what you should be doing. I think it's preferable. I I feel to to talk to CEOs, and the one whom I admire the most are those who um, um, read a lot outside of the domain of of expertise and uh, um, you know, current um, business activity. Uh, I, I don't think I can give names because it would be improper. But for example, I was um, I was doing um, um, a podcast um, for, for my subscribers with um, 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 a CEO, an American CEO who is the CEO of a very large American company, an airline company. And he was sharing with us that he begins his day by reading for three hours, no matter what, no matter what happens, he reads for three hours, he reads articles, he reads books, he walks, he thinks, and uh, I find it incredibly insightful. Um, and we ask him, you know, how can you manage uh, to put aside three hours of time every day um, to, to, to run a business which employs 400,000 people worldwide? And he said, well, if you want to, to, to think, if you want to make the right decisions, you need um, inspiration and uh, respiration. You need to be able to have some time devoted to, to your thinking business. Um, so I find it very insightful. Um, I find it quite contrarian because so many CEOs I know don't read. Uh, they go from one meeting to the next. Uh, they start meeting at eight in the morning and they finish meeting at ten in the evening. And uh, it's presentation after presentation and meetings upon meetings. Um, so to respond, you know, it's a long-winded, long-winded uh, response to your to your very simple question. But um, I, I don't I don't read business books. I I talk to CEOs and I try to talk to CEOs who can inspire me with unconventional approaches and it strikes me that reading beyond your domain of expertise is one such solution by the way by the way by the way uh, we're talking about entrepreneurs but uh, obama or clinton did, did the same you know, obama uh, president obama said that even in the midst of the most dramatic crisis that he had to face as a president and head of state he still managed to find an hour day to to read a novel because that's that's how you that's how you keep an open mind and that's how you become truly creative about the way in which you think about issues and problems. We have come to the end of today's discussion, which I found very interesting. On behalf of the Global Young Entrepreneur Society, Thierry Malloray, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And again, let me uh, tell you how impressed I am by what you're doing. And uh, I can't believe you're so young and already doing so much stuff. God knows what you'll be doing in 10, 15, 20 years from now. You know? Thank you very much.